Cause like a winter From around the world, wherever you are, we welcome you and thank you for joining us. Today we have a very interesting story. Part of our series we call The Amazing Conversions. We're going to have a story about a former playmate that turned pastor. That's right. We're here with Pastor Dana House. Welcome to The Circle, Pastor. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. This is a very fascinating story. Uh, well, every story in The Amazing Conversions has been very fascinating. Today we have a little bit of a twist. But before we get to the story of how you converted and found God, what I really want to know is you had a very interesting beginning in Playboy. You decided to do Santa Monica. We were talking earlier before the show. Right, right. Um, well, I was doing a modeling shoot on, um, it was a clothing shoot and the Fred Slatten shoes. And they were the shoes with the gigantic heels on them. And they were all sparkly. And I was standing in a plate glass window and a Playboy recruiter came up and gave me her card and said, you would be perfect for Playboy. Well, actually, I was very insulted. <laughs> very insulted by this? Yes. I, um, I was raised Southern Baptist, and my, par my grandparents were deacons of the Baptist church, and um, so we were Puritans. And mm -hmm. so I, the thought of doing Playboy magazine, who did they think I was? So um, it, she gave me her card, and that card kind of sat around my house for a long time. And uh, finally, the guy that was doing the photography that day called and said, you should just go and try. Just go and let them test shoot you. And so I did. And um, they said, okay, you can uh, take your clothes off now. And I said, what? <laughs> no one's ever ready for that. They took test shots of me and uh, they were whispering. And I thought, oh my gosh, what am I doing? Why am I here? Um, anyway, long story short, they loved me and they wanted to shoot a centerfold of me right away. Well, in some strange odd way I felt accepted I felt loved because I had suffered a lot of rejection when I was young um, and so I felt like somebody really cared and uh, so I agreed to do Playboy magazine and as they began to do the shoot I started having second thoughts I kept thinking why am I doing this is this really right and I had this inner voice saying this was wrong this was wrong so after it was all shot and we did the pictorial, um, I began not returning their phone calls and I began to fear that when it came out, what would my grandparents think, what would other people think of me. And so um, a lot of anxiety. I, it, wow. it was just so much confusion and anxiety and fear. 19. Oh, jeez, yeah. And so... I, wow. I decided that um, I didn't want to do it, and I told them that, and they said it was too late. You'd sign the contract, and you can either change your name and or you can leave your name and write your own story. And I'm one of the only playmates that has ever written her own story. What does that mean exactly when you said writing your own story? Did you write a, a story that wasn't about your life? That was totally no, no, different no. Or? It was a pictorial, but it was all about who I really was. And I, oh. I said in there, I'd rather be a, a play a, a nun than a sex pot. I wrote the whole story in the pictorial itself. So you actually wrote against almost what you were doing. Exactly. Interesting. But you can see the girl in there struggling because she also said something like, I also said something like, um, you know, who do I consider hot, you know, and, and I would put like some perverted stuff in there because that girl was still struggling with life because she was young. Sure. I was young. I keep saying she, like it's not me. <laughs> Did you, um, I know we talked a little bit about this before the show. You said you had some moments of shame. Well, because of the nudity, um, it's proven now that um, nudity and being nude it brings on a great deal of shame. And I struggled with shame my whole life. Um, up and until, I believe it was almost, it was after I was an ordained pastor um, just this thing that always said, you will never be loved by God. You'll never be used by God. No one loves you. You're a dirty little girl. Shame, shame on you. And I had a supernatural deliverance from that. And people say, well, how do you know you got delivered? And I said, well, when you know it's there, you know when it's gone. 
Hmm. We'll talk more about that in part two for sure to find out what that story and how she got into becoming a pastor. Before we get to that, um, and before we get to, I know there was incidences of drugs, it really spiraled down. It seemed like almost devolving at one point. But before we get to that point, um, were you the only girl you think that struggled with this? The, shame. The feeling of shame or the hesitancy or the apprehension of going and take a nude photo shoot at Playboy. Did you meet other girls while you were there? They were like, I don't want to do this either. No, I didn't, unfortunately. Oh, wow. Okay, that ends um, that question. They all, um, you know, it was their legacy. It was the what they will be go down in history and oh. known as. And everybody, I mean, they say that thousands and thousands of women want to do it. And they turn away people every day, even stars. That's true. Because um, hmm. they only take a chosen few. And so, um, but I'm sure because most of them are now mothers and they have children of their own, mm. I'm sure that it's not a fun thing to have your children look on the internet and there's nude pictures plastered all over the place. Although in today's world, in the 21st century, I mean, you know, stars are posing nude on purpose. And, um, you know, our world has changed a lot. And, it has. and so, but I'm sure there's a lot of shame that comes with that. I'm sure there's a lot of rejection that they get just as a human uh, with other people, you know, especially women. Yeah, that's terrible. And I, I know we we're going to talk a little bit about this, but before, um, I'm not sure what stages came in. At one point, you were actually doing a lot of movies. Mm -hmm. You were becoming really famous mm -hmm. and making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. That must have been really tough to let go. Well, I made $25,000 um, back 40 years ago. That was a lot of money to, for, do, for doing Playboy. $25,000 for one? Mm -hmm. Wow. And you were saying you were making quite a bit of money too doing... Um... I was doing um, uh, signing autographs, making a ton of money, doing guest spots on TV, doing movies with Henry Fonda and Susan Sarandon and... Uh, but I was uh, self-sabotaging self myself. So money wasn't enough? Well, the drugs were played into it, and mm. I spent all the money that I got. Um, you know, I, I just frivolously spent it on clothes and drugs and traveling, and just it all went away because I was looking for, for happiness. I was looking for that inner fulfillment. I was looking for the joy that I didn't have, that money could not give me, that fame didn't have for me either. Because I still wanted, I still wanted more, and I just didn't know what it was I wanted. And that actually led to a very, I guess, your, the lowest point in your life when you were taking the pills. I, it was uh, when I had come to the to the very very bottom of everything. I um, I was sleeping and uh, my drug dealer came over and he was like, "Come on, get up, Dana. We're gonna get high." And any other day I would have said, "Okay," but this day I said, "No. I hate you. I hate drugs. They've ruined my life, and I want you to leave." But before he left, I asked him for some sleeping pills. And he obliged. And when he left, I took them all at the same time. And I prayed to die in my sleep. And you had an interesting point you made earlier. That most people pray to, to live. And you were actually angry at God because you prayed. So I woke up the next morning hmm. and I was angry. I was angry at God because I wasn't dead, which is what he's talking about. I, I said, okay, if I'm going to live, then I'm going to live. And I want to live for you. If you want me to live, then I'm going to live. And so it was a major uh, point of my life of turning. And that's when, again, I went to church uh, with my sister and was uh, received the Lord as an adult and was baptized into water. But I spent the next 10 years walking one foot in and one foot out, still playing playmate roles and still getting lots of money and dating rich men and thinking things. And mm -hmm. I had come to the end of the list and uh, still was not happy. I still could not find fulfillment and what my purpose was. What was my destiny? Where was I going? Why am I here? You ask yourself those questions when money doesn't do it and fame doesn't do it. And you had a lot of both. I had a lot of both. It's a great lesson, I think, for many of us to learn. Money and power can't provide everything. Um, I don't want to continue on here. I think this is a great part. Uh, we, we covered a lot of interesting aspects of your career. We know you were on TV shows, movies, Playmate. 
Um, but then your life really changed. And it changed for the final time. It was the final conversion. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the final conversion. How do you really know when it's a conversion in part two? But before we leave this part, is there anything you want to tell individuals uh, about, um, how would you say, your life change at the very end when you finally converted? But before you got there, was there, was there anything that triggered it? Um, yeah, it, just the fact that I had no purpose. I, I, I prayed to God, what, where am I supposed to be? What am I supposed to be doing? I have this talent, and I'm working as a waitress, and I'm doing makeup, and but I have no joy. I have no purpose. Where am I going? So I just want to say to you that if you have all those questions, and you either have nothing or you have everything, but you still don't know your purpose, we were born for a purpose to fulfill for God. And until everybody desires to be loved, everyone, and we may look for it in many different places, but we will never truly find satisfaction until we find the love of God. Where can we learn more about you, Pastor Dana? You can go to my website at www.danahouseministries.com. You can also follow me on Twitter and Facebook and uh, or see me at the church on the way in van nuys california all right welcome to adelante this is adelante recovery and my name is yvette kuglin and i'm part of the staff adelante recovery center has helped people in dual diagnosis for five years we accept most PPO insurances and provide luxury accommodations and 24-hour support. To speak with an admissions counselor, call 1-888-242-4450. A lot of time, we don't even know what's wrong with us, and sometimes we need to get away to figure that out. So if you want to go for a little retreat out in Corona Del Mar, which is a confidential location, we're here to help. So... We're only a phone call away. Thank you. Pastor Dana House is with us. She was a former playmate. Now she's a pastor. Welcome to the circle, Dana. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Now, in part one, we talked a lot about your history, mm -hmm. your playboy life that you had, your previous life. I want to start today's show starting to explore your new life. But you also wanted to talk a little bit about the Price is Right and how they got involved in all this. Well, they were looking, the Price is Right was looking for a replacement for the three girls that did like, here's the refrigerator, you know, uh, the models. And I really wanted that role. I really wanted it. So I put my son in the car. He was eight years old. Drove down to the church and uh, got baptized. And I left with more than wet hair. <laughs> I left and was very soon baptized in the Holy Spirit. And um, it was about a week after I was uh, baptized. I did not get the job on The Price is Right. The, the, the Lord had a different plan for me. But I had an epiphany at, of God, of Jesus, at the foot of my bed. Um, I was with a person who was reading me the Bible. It was This was kind of my boot camp person who was taking me through the ropes of learning how to renew my mind for Jesus. And I looked up and it was uh, an illuminating figure of Jesus at the foot of my bed. And I closed my eyes and he was still there and I opened my eyes and he was still there and I closed my eyes and finally I said, okay, 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 I know you're real, I know you're real, I know you're real. Um, and he said, Dana, wherever you've been, I've been with you. But, and, and I followed you wherever you've been. But now you've got to follow me. And I said, okay, 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 okay. You know, I didn't really know what to do. It was such a supernatural thing. And in fact, I didn't really tell anybody for a very long time. I thought they, for fear, they would think I was not right in the head. Because it was such a supernatural. And that was the conversion that then... I gave up the rich man, and I gave up my career, and I gave up uh, all of the worldly things that I had uh, brought into my life. I was stripped, literally stripped of everything. I sold my furs, I sold my jewelry, 
and I started working at a church for seven dollars and twenty five cents an hour. Seven dollars and twenty five cents. Wow. That's a big difference. Well, it was, I kept saying, this cannot be God. This is not God. <laughs> In fact, the pastor that I went to work for took me to a restaurant called the Toasted Bun, and I said, yep, God has toasted my bun. I have been horrible, and I'm being punished. <laughs> but it just went from that to serving in children's ministries, being a platform worship singer, into the drama ministry, single mother's ministry because I was a single mom, and uh, then a deliverance ministry. I went on mission trips. I was sold out for Jesus. And um, it was a very, very supernatural um, supernatural lifestyle change because when you go from being a playmate and a sex star to the next day for years I wouldn't even wear makeup I gained a bunch of weight I didn't want to be a sex pot anymore I didn't want to be uh, some man's arm candy I didn't want to be known for all of that I wanted to start over again and basically it was like I was in kindergarten and I had to go through the steps, and then if I was really good, I could skip fourth grade, but it was like I was starting all over again, because the word says, come as a child. And it, literally, it was like being a child and having to learn how to do things all over again, because I was delivered of lust and perversion because of Playboy and because of men. I, just, I thought if I could have sex with a man, that that would be love. And then when I found God, I found true love. So I had to deal with all of the stuff that I had. And eventually, I was sleeping, and I woke up from an afternoon nap, and I heard the Lord say, uh, the kings are anointed. And I looked in First Kings and Second Kings and all through my Bible, and I was like, the kings are anointed, the kings are anointed. I couldn't figure it out. And one day I was walking down the hallway at my church and I looked up and it said King's College and Seminary. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no, 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 you've got the wrong girl. I'm not going to Bible college. <laughs> well, God won. Um, I went four years, worked every day and went to school every night and graduated from Bible college. And then waited. That's a question I wanted to ask okay, you yeah. about that. Um, that was, is that a tough thing for a female? Going through a Bible college, it seems to be uh, religions a lot of times are classified as male dominated. Yes. What was your experience like that? During it that? was hard. It was really hard, but it wasn't just hard because of the woman part of it, even though we, I, I have dealt with that so much. But it was also, I was 50 and everybody else was 22 in college, oh. or they were pastors that were online. But the it's hard when you're a beautiful woman and these pastor's wives or people that are teachers, you know, they, it was hard. I didn't say a word for the first two years. Were you I, disappointed that the men of the church, mm, not targeting anybody specific, but were, didn't give you the fair shot? Being single was as bad as being a woman because everyone in the church is married. Everyone in the church is married. Did you feel excluded? And, uh, well, not excluded, but I felt like... Um, I felt like there was this thing that they knew that, okay, she's not going to go any further than that because we're just going to put her right over there. <laughs> they stopped you cold here. <laughs> but um, I overcame that because God had a plan, and so he, he had that for me. I went, to, um, I went to get my license in the four square two years after I graduated, and then four years after that, I was ordained. So I went through the process of four-square denomination. We don't fight it as much as with women in our, because Amy Simple McPherson is a woman who, dis, who started our denomination. We're four-square, and a woman started our denomination. So wow. we don't deal with it as much as other denominations do. I guess not. So it's good. You overcame the challenge. You became a pastor. And what was the first thing you did? When you came out, you got your, your, your uh, I don't know what you call it, is it a degree? My degree. degree. Okay, uh -huh. you got your degree. My degree. Did you start your own church? Did you look, did you work at another church? What did you first do? Well, it didn't really 
change anything because I was already um, in ministry at the church. It just oh, okay. gave me the credentials I needed. I had already been the single mother's uh, pastor for seven years. Um, but n- now I do uh, the radio for Church on the Way. I am their, I'm their oh. prayer pastor. Nice. And I also do a lot of their drama because once you're an artist, you always have that, you know. Uh, but I minister deliverance a lot one-on-one to people um, with rejection and abandonment and shame and all of the things. See, shame, when in the garden, shame came when Adam and Eve fell. They were naked, but they didn't care they were naked until they fell and they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. Well, those fig leaves today are addictions. Shopping, overeating, uh, prescription pills, um, all of those things, alcohol, um, you, you know, the things that we cover our and medicate ourselves with in order to do away with that shame, which it doesn't do away with it. It just keeps it under the water as long as you're on top of it. But the minute you get off. So I deal with a lot of deliverance and shame and addiction. Um, I had, I was addicted and even I was addicted to prescription pills. And I feel like the Lord has given me a prophetic word right now. If you have a, uh, an addiction to medication, to prescription medication, the Lord wants to deliver you from that. He wants to take that away from you because it's lying to you that it's your friend when in reality, it's keeping you from your own destiny. That leads me to another question. How did you know it was God's voice? And not just your own saying, you know, stop this, do this, do that. How do you know when God's talking to you? Okay. God is our Father. And if you know Him, when He talks to you, you can hear Him. If your own Father called you, would you know His voice? Sure. sure. If you were in another room and He called you, would you know His voice? You have to know Him to be able to hear Him. And when you know him well, his personality, he's never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's our four square denomination scripture. And he, you know his voice. Now, Satan is a liar, and he's the father of lies. So it's his job to lie to you. So if you are hearing a voice that's causing confusion or strife or pride or division, that's not God. God is peaceful. God is love. And he's very accepting. And then you have your own voice, which you have to change the things you say and do because we always put ourselves down and out of our mouth we speak our own curses. Oh, I'll never do this. I'll never be able to do that. And then you have to stop that, those things. Oh. And so, um, but if you know God, you know his voice. Let me ask you this question. I like that analogy. I think it's really neat. What happens when you don't know God? Like when you were, didn't hear God, you didn't know God, or maybe you kind of knew God, but then you heard the final, you saw the final Jesus. Does it take one of those kind of epiphanies for us to hear the voice when you really don't know God or what? You know what I mean? No, because I think that, that, that God loves us so much. There, there are times in our lives when he'll speak to us or when he'll shut a door. Hmm. and he will cause us to go in a place where we thought we were going one way and all of a sudden he's going this way, but we miss it because we don't believe. So when, we, when we're unbelievers, we can't always see and know the direction, but somehow his voice is also direction. His voice is also in the word. If hmm. you're in the word, if you're not a believer and you don't believe, then it's going to be very difficult to hear the voice of God. However, he is, he's supernatural. He can find a way to have himself known to you. So it's safe to say he knows the medium to use with each and every one of us. Exactly. Whether it's yeah. a movie, whether it's a church service, whether it's a friend, you know, God is the God of the universe, and he has something to say to you if only you believe. That's great. Well, in the last minute here or two, what would you say to people right now that are struggling, that are having these hard challenges, people who don't have purpose in their life? What would you say to them if they came to you? So if I came to you, let's say, and I said, Pastor, I just don't know where I'm at in my life. What would you recommend for me to do? What I would recommend for you to do is to give your life over to the Lord, to surrender your will for His will. 
and to give up control. My life was all about what I could and could not control. And if I couldn't control it, I didn't want it. But when I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I gave up my will for His will. And if you're in that place right now where you don't know where you're going, you don't know what your purpose is, you don't know what to do with life, I would suggest that you surrender to the Lord and let Him fulfill the purpose that He has for your life. From the very beginning of time when you were in your mother's womb, He knew what He wanted you to do. You live your life for Him. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all things will be added unto you. And get yourself in the Word and get yourself in a nice Bible-believing church. Thank you so much, Pastor Dana. Once again, where do we get a hold of you if you want more information or learn more about you? You can visit my website at www.danahouseministries.com or you can follow me on Twitter and Facebook. Pastor Dana has one of those great qualities, beautiful on the outside, beautiful on the inside. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Remember, our motto is simple. Wherever there's psychology involved, we are there. We'll see you next time, everyone.